Okay, welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to the first, first uh, High Order Beat talk. Um, I have to thank Bruce Sterling, uh, who's here and is going to talk uh, on a Wednesday morning, because when we met, we met three times to discuss the conference over the f past several months. And at, at some point, uh, it, it told me among many other amazing ideas uh, that uh, he's so capable of producing uh, an amazing speed, he told me, you know, you should really, really invite uh, Massimo Banzi because, uh, and of course I knew him, uh, I know what he's doing with Arduino, and, uh, but I asked him, well, can you please explain me? Sure, he's a great speaker, but what's the connection with universities? And he told me, well, of course, because uh, Arduino, this amazing open source and open hardware platform, is uh, a device that is aggregating knowledge, is a is in itself a platform for learning to, to some extent. It's itself also a platform for people from around the world to gather virtually around this device. So it's a sort of hardware university, maybe? Massimo. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Massimo Banzi, and I'm one of the uh, co-founders of this uh, Arduino project that I'm going to try to introduce you to in the next 15 minutes. Um, how, do I, how do I start? Essentially, I, I teach interaction design. So it is kind of new, in a way, a way to look at design where not only you start looking at the shape of objects, but you start looking at the way people interact with objects. And when I'm talking about objects, I'm talking about objects that contain some sort of digital technology. So everyday objects like mobile phones and computers, you know, you can actually design the way you interact with, this, with these objects, and you can actually create beautiful, poetic, uh, satisfying, funny experiences, or you can create terrible, very annoying, very frustrating experiences. So the way, the experience that you create when you interact with an object, it's one of the I think new frontiers that design has to tackle. And um, in the area where I work, we stress very much that students have to make prototypes. They must make prototypes. Because if you're trying to develop the way that people interact with an object, then you, know, they, you need to try things with people. So the only way is to make a prototype. Here you see a picture of a prototype done by somebody that wanted to make some sort of a strange thermostat that you can control over the internet. It looks a bit like a bomb. But the interesting thing about this is that somebody with very little knowledge about electronics and very little knowledge about software was able to put this together in a matter of hours. And this is incredibly important for me, the ability to take people that don't have a background in technology, they don't have a background in software, and make them able to play with the medium. And so we are bringing people that don't have technical backgrounds, so we're talking about designers, artists, architects, musicians, and giving them the ability to play with the new medium of technology by finding new ways to teach to these people. Uh, we started this project in this place called the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea, which was a design, it was a res research center and a design school based in Ivrea that lasted for about four or five years. And, um, and, and inside that place, we, we were teaching only interaction design. So we started to think about the fact that if we want to create a new type of designer and you want to work on a new discipline, you need to work on different tools. So, for example, this is, a, this is a map of a lot of tools that we developed in Ivrea during those years. And I don't, I'm not going to explain to you all the, what all the blobs mean, but essentially this is a lot of like, open source software that we took from the MIT and, and that was used to teach designers how to program. And then we started to do a lot of experiments. And then you see at the, at the end over there, there is this Arduino platform that we created. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit better uh, what, it, what it is. 
but essentially our idea was to how do we find a way to teach students how to use electronics and software to make things in a way that would be cheap and also that would be easy to share with other people because a lot of work that was done in this area was done f fundamentally for engineers and, and beginners, people that don't have a technical background, are very, very scared by everything that's designed for an engineer because it's got a lot of buttons, a lot of lights, a lot of switches and, you know, engineers like that, but, you know, beginners, they're scared. They, they, they think this has got too many things on it. How am I going to learn this? So, together with some friends, we started to work on this project. So, I'm quickly going to introduce all of them. Uh, David Cuartieres is a Spanish professor teaching in Sweden. And then Gianluca Martino is from, uh, is from Torino. And, uh, and he's the one who manufactures this Arduino board that I'm going to show you. Uh, David Mellis is a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab, who is the one that deals with most of the software part. And Tom Igo is a professor at NYU. And the five of us essentially cover all the areas, software, hardware, documentation, dealing with people, going around the world, talking about it. And, and the five of us essentially make, make the Arduino project. So Arduino is made out of four pillars. First of all, in the, in the top left corner, you see this little board. It's the size of a credit card. It's a small computer that you can connect through the USB connection to your computer, and you can program it with the software that you see on, on the other side. The idea here is that the software is open source and is derived from this language called processing that they invented at the MIT to teach students how to program. And we extended that so that it could work with hardware. And we made a circuit that would be as simple as possible. So we took away everything. We wanted to make it incredibly simple because if somebody looks at it and says, okay, there are about 20 components on this board, I have a chance that I might learn how it works because it looks simple simpler than what's available. And then there's two other parts that are very important in Arduino, is the, um, the methodology based on hands-on learning, so a lot of practical learning and a very, very little, oh, very little um, theory, and the community. So I'm gonna quickly show you. So this is a, the computer, as I said, is something that sells for about 20 euros or 30 dollars. It's manufactured in Scarmagno, near Torino, which is the place where Olivetti used to manufacture all the computers. So the Arduino, the manufacturer is much smaller than Olivetti, but still we made about 150,000 of these. This is the software. So we wanted to design the software as simple as possible, so we managed to squeeze it down to seven buttons. So the whole software has seven buttons. So this is exactly the opposite of what you get in the classic platforms that software engineers like, you know, that people like, like hundreds of buttons and menus and switches and modes and, you know, we had one window with seven buttons because we didn't want anybody to be scared, you know, to be too afraid by, by the platform. And then we started to teach essentially by letting people build things. You know, I learned when I was a kid. And for me, when I connected two wires and something didn't explode, for me this was a learning experience. You know, I didn't it was, you know, that the books were like too complicated for me. So experimenting was much, was much easier. So I tried to do the same with my students. I let them build something and then we work on that. So we tend to work in a way that we don't give them too much theoretical background at the beginning. And then we wait until the moment where the students are coming back to us and say, please explain to me now the theory because I can't move forward. So that's the only moment where they have their mind open. Because, you know, when I was in university, I have to say, I, sp I was studying electrical engineering, I spent years sitting in a chair with people like talking to me. And there was very little activity that I could do practically and that was very frustrating for me. And then the community is incredibly important. We put everything online, so we open source the software, but we also open source the hardware, which was something that is kind of new. Not a lot of people have done that. So anybody could start copying our circuit, extend it, modify it. So we created a whole ecology of companies around the world where you have people that make little modules that you plug on Arduino, they manufacture it themselves, and then they put it online and they start selling. So you have like this one person companies started around Arduino. And uh, so we have a forum 
that this is an old screenshot, but at the moment we have about 20,000 active members. This means people who are contributing constantly, asking questions, answering questions. So all the tech support, as you might define it, is all done here. And then we have this thing that I really love. It's this wiki called the Playground. This is kind of like the Wikipedia of Arduino. People come here and they describe technical solutions that they found in their own language. So these, you will find things that will make an engineer faint because of the language they're described in. But it's great for beginners. People do not understand, they don't have a background. They read the language is familiar and they get into it. So here you find users explaining other users how to do everything with this circuit. So I would say after we started this in Ivrea, we had this uh, issue that Ivrea was going to be closed down by, the, by, the, by its main sponsor, Telecom Italia. So we wanted the project to survive. So we started to publish everything. All the documentation is with the Creative Commons license, share alike. So there's no commercial limitation on the, on the project. The design of the hardware is also Creative Commons and the software is GPL or LGPL so that you can actually make commercial products with Arduino without paying, without re revealing your, your source code. The only thing that is protected in Arduino is the name. So in order to use the Arduino name, you, you need to get an authorization from us. Also because there's a lot of people that extend Arduino in a positive way, there's also a lot of people who just clone Arduino. They just copy it. So, and sometimes they sell like badly manufactured Chinese circuits as Arduino with the made in Italy and everything cloned and then they don't work. So we want to protect people that when they buy something that says Arduino, they get a certain level of experience. And so after we, we kind of set up the project, we kind of got the help of, this, of the ITP, which is another exciting school in New York that started to use this with their students. And the moment people started to see this, projects, they started to get really into Arduino. This was back in 2006. Then we got some online retailers like Sparkfun Electronics that started selling Arduino when the founder was basically working out of his own apartment. And now they're a $10 million company and they sell essentially all the bits and pieces that you need to do things with electronics. And essentially their big market is students, designers, people at home, and then another important part in the whole Arduino system is this magazine called Make from the editor, the, um, for this editor called O'Reilly. They basically revived within the geek, geek community this idea of making things by yourself. So they started to describe hardware projects in a very uh, beginner friendly way with beautiful, beautiful typesetting. And they started to launch these manifestos, like if you, can, if you can't open a product, then you don't really own it. Or they published the Maker's Bill of Rights. So if you like to make things, then you have rights. And, and I like, I mean, one of the important things that I like about Arduino is that it, is, it, it has enabled a lot of people, including children, to make things and to create little businesses, to make products that didn't exist. And it's, I think it's a contraposition with the current trend that people like Apple have, that you basically get this hardware and you're just a consumer of things that people are pushing towards you with a price tag attached to it. But I come from the, I was a kid in the 80s when people with a few hundred dollars, they bought home computers, they learned how to program and they made a career out of it. And so we want to try to revive that kind of DIY philosophy that created a lot of interesting companies and interesting ideas and kind of freed up the mind of people. So this is, um, you know, there are, we kind of fit in this culture of like instructables.com where you can find information online about everything from making cakes to making uh, electronic circuits, furniture, everything. So, and also one of the things that I love about Arduino is that it's actually helped a lot of people go back to real life, to, to have community that happens happen in real life. So here are different places around the world where people get together and they make things and they teach each other how to make things. And for example, like out of the NYC resistor in New York, there are big Arduino users, they start to spin off small companies now. I'm gonna show you now quickly a few articles that came out about this open source 
uh, model. This is from Wired magazine. This is the Italian Wired magazine. And then the Wall Street Journal. So they all started to look at this business model where you kind of give away things and, and you create a community and everybody kind of shares. And then you get people that clone the board, like this Chinese company who makes like new version of the board. Or you have these people in Chile who didn't have the money to buy the board, so they made them themselves by hand. They made 25 of these by hand. It's really painful. It's like a lot of handwork, but they made it. So I love this idea that you can access this technology for free and make it if you don't have the money. These are the few schools in the world that are using Arduino now. It started to become a standard in the design world. Um, and then a few companies like Apple is using Arduino and Asus, Panasonic, Hitachi. All these companies are actually using Arduino internally to prototype things. I'm going to show you two projects and I'm done. Uh, so we started using Arduino to make things at school, like this is an interactive wallpaper that, uh, that we made with Arduino. This is a table I made for an exhibition in Milan, it's a multi-touch table. We made prototypes of lamps for Artemide, which is an Italian manufacturer of design lamps. And then we made light installations for Arup in London, or this is the Campari Museum, is all made with Arduino boards. And then people started to make these, like these are students who made this type of alarm clock that it's all touch sensitive and you can flip it around or made this chair that has sensors inside and it has these beautiful light effects when you move it or people who basically hacked their coffee machine and added the Wiimote so that they could basically have a different you know the, it was a beautiful software making perfect coffee and a crazy interface the same guy made this boat which is also controlled by a Wiimote and it's electric and spin on itself. People made remote controls for the iPod, or some stu a student made a prototype of a, uh, of a small display that you can wear on your wrist, and it became a company, sponsored by, uh, I think it was sponsored by BlackBerry di directly. Last project, this, um, Leah Buckley is a researcher at the MIT. She made an Arduino that you can sew into your, into your, into fabric so you can make clothing with it. And she made a lot of projects with it, like different exploration in fashion and wearable technology, people who made their own Segway. So there's lots, there's lots of projects, but my time has run out. So, <laughs> uh, I hope I gave you a small idea of what people are what kind of community this has created. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. I think he will be around, so if you have questions, just uh, look for him. And now 